introduce again uh, Michael N1PLH, raise your hand. He is actually the real DMR expert. I brought him as a ringer, so when I stumble, I will point over there. He's been doing a lot longer than I have. He also has a lot of expertise with the Motorola radios, whereas a lot of us here have the, uh, the Connect systems, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this picture means nothing other than that if I was going to put up an antenna, that looks like a good spot. When you Google for things, that's what you get. Just quick about me, I've been in this area a long time. Um, I was actually the first ham radio club I think I joined when I moved here was Sarah in maybe 1980, something like that. Uh, but I, then I was more active with the K1DR group in New Canaan, if anybody remembers that crowd. And uh, I retired as a computer guy a few years ago and then got into HF. I was really never into HF until recently. Um, but the key point here is I'm not super radio techie. I mean, I've built some things, I can solder stuff, I can do some things, but if you start asking me really complicated questions, I'm going to point to someone else. Um, and that's the stuff that I have at home um, to play with. So, um, I thought we would start with a quick demonstration because usually you have to wait till the very end and then you're bored and sleepy. And um, we'll just do a quick demo of DMR. Um, as you guys all know, you guys now have a repeater up at Sterling um, that's converted to DMR, and it's on the Aries network, and we'll talk about the two different networks. Um, but what's interesting about DMR, because these are commercial radios, and I don't know if you're going to be able to hear it, but when I key up, when I do the push to talk, you're going to hear a tone. If you don't hear the tone, you can't talk. It means the radio hasn't synced up with the repeater, so to speak, and you're not really clear to talk. So I'm going to key up and just see if you can hear the tone. So everybody quiet for a second. Yeah, it's kind of good. Uh, N1CLV, WB2JBB. Hope the man with the deep voice is there. Wayne, don't let me down. He's letting me down. Come forward, good buddy. Yeah. Here. See, I keyed up too quick. Did you hear the boop? I did that on purpose, so that means it wasn't ready for me. Okay, N1CLV, WB2JBB. Um, we're in front of the Stanford Amateur Radio Club here in Stanford. So if you wouldn't mind just telling them in 10 seconds where you are and who you are, I'd appreciate it. Oh, did I get booped again? Okay, well, my name is Wayne. The call is N1CLV. I'm the Connecticut Section Emergency Coordinator, and I'm in East Lyme, Connecticut. Um, talking through the Connecticut Aries DMR repeater in the ledger. Thank you. you. See, it beeps when he drops as well. Okay, Wayne, thanks for that. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, we're going to go on with the actual presentation here. We might have some more people want to try some stuff later. Um, so if you're around, that'd be great. If not, I appreciate you hanging in for me. N1CLV, WB2JDV. Okay, Paul. Good luck with the presentation. And I'm uh, usually listening here and don't always answer everybody, but I do listen quite a bit. So we'll talk to you later. And once you So, you know, that's East Lime. The audio is pretty good. It's interesting. Some people, I think it depends on their voice. Some people sound like they got the clothespin on the nose when they're talking on digital radio, and some people don't. And I haven't really figured out what the pattern is. I haven't recorded myself, so I don't know which category I fall into. Um, the other thing we're going to talk about uh, later on are these talk groups. How did I reach, reach Wayne? How did we know sort of how to sync up? And that's sort of the whole backbone of digital mobile radio are these talk groups and the paths between repeaters. So Michael is going to give a call out on a different talk group and see if we can get a rise out of someone else, perhaps more farther away. So, Michael, give it a shot. We won't go world, but we'll just take a look. Okay, let's try it. Is that one PLH in North America? Is anybody around for a demo? Thank you, sir. Thank we're you, in sir. Connecticut. We're in Connecticut. Can you give me a location, please? Uh, this is WA Amateur Mobile. I'm going to get your slide down over here. Uh, I'm in Louisville, Michigan. It's a suburb. Uh, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you very much. Good night. I'm three, uh, and also I'm talking to 
Okay, and we'll we'll do radio show and tell later. So that was just a quick demo, you know, local stuff in Connecticut and some nationwide stuff. Fairly easy to do. So let's talk about how that all got started. Uh, I do have to do a little bit of background on digital mobile radio itself. It's a European Telecommunications Standards Institute uh, published worldwide standard. There's a lot of manufacturers who make these radios. You can see the list up there. Uh, that's good and bad. The good news is you have a lot of choice. The bad news is a little bit. These are still commercial radios. They're still <coughs> being sold for commercial purposes for businesses and, and other uses. So it's not like that cheap ham gear where we can go pull it out of the old taxis or the police cars because it's been obsoleted, because it's been narrow band. You know, whatever the reason is, we used to get equipment from lots of places and as hams, tinker with it and use it to our own devices. So um, some of this stuff is a little bit pricey and you'll hear about that later on. There are, there is, you know, some, some cheaper alternatives, but um, you have to be ready for a little sticker shock for some of the gear. Uh, it does use some newer technology in the voice digital to anal analog to digital conversion. Um, and I'll get into more of these things later. It does have some longer battery life if you like to talk a lot. And it's sort of like the old Wrigley's gum, two, two, two repeaters in one. And you're all probably too young for that, some of you. Um, so we'll talk about why there's two repeaters in one. It's really interesting, and I think that's sort of the signature feature, DMR. And it is certainly growing. So this graph, um, uh, John redid it for me because apparently my graph broke, the, broke his computer. Uh, but you can see it, it all of a sudden has taken off. In terms of repeater count, we're up to well over 1,000 DMR repeaters um, in the network. Subscriber count is well over 12,000. A subscriber is basically anyone with a radio. You do have to have a, an, a unique code basically in your radio that says it's you. Um, but you can see the graph there. It's just really going really fast. So why are people taking this sort of technology uh, you know, on board and what is it? Um, okay. Well, let's talk about what it's not. It's not IRLP. If you've heard about the Internet Relay Linking Protocol where repeaters can link up together, uh, you can you know, punch t some touch tones in and hook your repeater into the network. We used to do that in Norwalk, although we're currently off the air. But DMR repeaters are all linked together, but you can't really control them that way. They're sort of permanently linked together. It's not Echolink. You can't connect to it from a PC. Uh, you have to have a radio through a repeater. My guess is that will probably change. Someone will write something to make that happen. But right now, there's none of these PC dongles, things you can do with D-Star. Uh, you have to have a radio. Yezu Fusion is kind of out there. A very slow uptake on that, so I'm not going to talk about that. Same with APCO 25, and uh, Mike, you probably know more about that than I do. Um, but you know, it's more used for, for the public service guys. Uh, and there are some hams doing it, but again, very limited use. Um, why DMR? It's a new mode. And what do we do when we get a new mode? Look how many of these things here. There's one. There's one. I got one. The hams love to buy new stuff. We got to have a new radio. So that could be really, literally, one part of why this has grown so fast. But one of the things that's always bothered me about this sort of stuff is, as you all know, there's less of us talking than there used to be. So we're actually diluting the airwaves even more. And I got some people on analog, some on D-Star, some on DMR, kind of spreading the number of operators over more repeaters. So you know, if, if, if anything, it may actually make us less busy on the air. I don't know. We'll see. It may be a bubble. It may pop. I don't particularly think so. But the closest thing to DMR um, is D-Star. Now, are there any D-Star people in the room? I was D-Star, I don't have a radio now, so not a lot of D-Star. Um, but let's talk about it real quick, because if you're not, not a lot of D-Star people, or I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, D-Star is essentially ICOM. Everybody says anybody could build a D-Star radio, no one else has. ICOM actually trademarked the word D-Star. Um, so it, but it is 100% ham radio focused. So ICOM has positioned it that way. DMR, as we said before, is a lot of vendors. There's over 3 million people using DMR radios somewhere in the world. And you can see the split. A little bit of public safety, but more of it's business. Taxi cabs, uh, power companies, other industries who need radios. Technology's a little bit newer, maybe a new generation. So 
the voice quality is a little bit better. Um, but yet the D-Star has a lot more gizmos. You've got apps, you can send GPS data. Um, I mean, DMR's got some of that stuff in it as well, but it's more tinkering available uh, with D-Star. DMR was designed for commercial use initially. And I will say, initially it's harder to program, and that's only because the software really hasn't caught up with the radios the way hams like to use them. Uh, D-Star was still a little bit more difficult, but there's D-Star radios now where you can basically go into an area and using a GPS and say, load in the closest five repeaters and it'll do it. Uh, there's no equivalent to that yet in D-Star, at least with some of these, I mean, in DMR, with some of these radios. If you're going to take a trip, you better take a PC with you because there's no easy front panel programming of these things. Yes, you can do it, and if you're really, you know, sharp, but it's just not like picking up your Baofeng and putting in a frequency and hit and go. So they are hard to program. There is, like I said, one way to do it, a radio to a repeater. Uh, with D-Star, you can do the... the um, the dongles, the DVAPs, the DV Megas, if you've been played with that stuff, lots of ways to get on the D-Star network. Um, we'll talk about these talk groups. The talk groups are chosen at the radio, and that's the example we just did before. When I called Wayne, I was on the Connecticut statewide talk group. When Mike called that fellow in Michigan, he was on the North America talk group. So by changing your channel selector, you can change which talk group you're going to go out on. In D-Star, the repeater owner, or whoever's running the repeater, says, I'm connecting my repeater to this reflector, which is kind of like a talk group, and any other repeaters on that reflector will be connected together when you key up. So that's a big difference between the two. They both have worldwide network connections. Uh, there is one discount brand, which is the one that a lot of us have here. Uh, that's 195 bucks with the cable and software. Uh, a D-Star radio, the cheapest one is about 330 bucks with cable and software. So uh, D-Star is still expensive. Um, these radios are pretty robust, especially the one that the Motorola's that like Michael has. These are commercial radios. Um, there you'll drop them, you can do whatever to them and they're going to hold up. Um, however, uh, same with the repeaters. However, with D-Star you could make a repeater, a couple of radios, a controller, make your own repeater. Can't do that with DMR, especially with these networks, you have to use what's compatible, and right in Connecticut, that's Motorola's. Uh, but let's talk about why um, this is kind of a good thing for the spectrum, um, maybe rounding a little bit. Like traditional analog, like an FM repeater, um, you're using 25 kilohertz to carry on a conversation. Uh, on your repeater, your Stanford repeater, right, that we're all familiar with. In DMR, the signal is 12 and a half, so it's half the bandwidth and it's also carrying two conversations at the same time. So basically you're doing four conversations, if you will, in the space of one. So as the spectrum gets tight, we can start doing these um, repeater spacings can start to get tighter together. And I think there might be some effort going on in, in the spectrum management agencies who do this stuff uh, to coordinate the repeaters, to start to put the digital repeaters in a different spot of the spectrum than the analog so they can fit more in because clearly you could fit uh, a lot more conversations in the same, the same bandwidth. Uh, the other thing which I found interesting when putting this together, and I gotta give Ken AG2K a lot of credit, he, he gave me a lot of these slides to start with. Um, it's just like, how many programmers do we have in here? No one's, after the first guy wrote a program, no one ever wrote another full program. You copied from the guy before you and made changes. Like if you're a COBOL programmer, you never recoded that top stuff, right? Because it never changed. There's only one diagram on the whole internet that says TS1, TS2 like that. Somebody wrote it once and it's in every DMR presentation I've ever seen. Why it's a cylinder with chunks, I don't know. But this is the key to the whole thing. So we're gonna spend a minute on this slide. I don't have a pointer. But as the signal's going out, there are these 30 millisecond time slots and that's what TDMA means, time division, whatever, multiple axis, multiple axis thank you. So in this example, which you probably can't see the tiny little words, there's four radios there. One and two, three and four. So because of the two time slots, radio one and radio three are having a two-way conversation, and radio two and radio four are also having a conversation. There's a point at that. Look at that. Right. Because you finally found a use for that thing. If you look at the colors, the darker colors, I'm not sure I should thank you or not. Um, <laughs> That conversation is going on whether this conversation is going on or not. So you don't notice the 30 millisecond chops as you're, as you're talking. 
So the signal's going out sort of like that, okay? So again, traditional FM, one conversation at 25 kilohertz DMR, two conversations in 12 and a half. So this is really, it's both the good part of DMR and it's the confusing part of DMR when you get to the programming of this because the repeaters, which you'll see in a minute when I show the Norwalk and the Stanford repeaters, have two time slots. It's almost like two channels, but you don't want to use that word. It's definitely called a time slot. And on that time slot are taught groups. So there's a lot of layers involved in this. And that's what, when you first look at the programming, you open up that program and load up somebody's example programming, it's a little bit <coughs> confusing. Um, this is as far as I get technically. There's an analog signal, digital signal, but you can see that DMR uses a form of you know, FSK. So when you're sending a one, frequency gets faster. So if you want to look this stuff up, there's the website. There are all kinds of details on this, um, but it's not appropriate for this presentation. So basically, it's still using technology we're familiar with. And in those packets that are being sent is this kind of crap, right? So if you're the kind of guy who likes to pull apart IP headers on your network at home, you can have a lot of fun with this. And again, if you Google dmr-primer.pdf, you can get this document, and it talks about when you key up, it sends out a header, it sends out data, it sends it does error checking and error correction. So that's one of the reasons that this DMR is popular is because it does actually correct bit errors, uh, uses forward error correction, and all this stuff is just like IP over a, a computer network, very sophisticated. Um, one of the other things, which I, you know, I guess I've experienced this a little bit. One of the selling points and um, of digital is that the quality is very good until you're gone, right? You're either there, nice quality, and then you're gone. Whereas we all know with analog, as you get out of range, you get scratchy, you start picket fencing, all the things that happen um, when your signal gets weak. So, what this is trying to show is that a given level of signal. So let's say my signal strength is here. The audio quality for analog is a little lower than that of DMR. Or you could say for this level of audio quality, I can maintain that level of quality as my signal gets weaker and weaker. At some point, obviously, they both drop off and there's nothing there. But the whole point is you get better quality for a given signal and a little bit better coverage for a given audio quality. And I've kind of noticed that you know, and having used it. Um, the audio quality is very consistent all the way through until you start to go with these digital, in D-Star they call it R2-D2, I don't know, is there a name for it? And packet Just loss. packet loss. You start to lose packets and you just start to break up and your voice goes away. Um, and again, because it's got the error correction, that's how it gets away with that, with the weak signal. Uh, as long as it can piece it back together, um, you're still there. So that's that's a kind of cool part about the digital stuff. And this applies both to D-Star and DMR, really. Uh, longer battery life, because if you think about it, if you're in these 30 millisecond blocks of time, you're really transmitting half the time, right? Versus analog, when you key down, you're 100% transmitting. This thing is doing these little 30 millisecond bursts. So your battery life, if you transmit a lot, is, uh, say, about 40% better than analog. I think on receive, I haven't really noticed much difference on receive. It's, it's about the same. It's really the transmit where you get some gain. Okay, so any questions so far before we get into this whole talk group thing? I know I'm going kind of fast, but I did have a lot of slides. But this is where it sort of gets fun. So just want to get the basics of the technology out of the way, and now we can talk about how it works sort of from a practical perspective. Um, the way these repeaters are connected together or even if you're talking on your own repeater locally, everything is always on a talk group. You're not just keying up on a frequency and having it repeated like we are with analog. So here's a sample of some talk groups that are out there. And I'll talk about, there's a group that standardizes these so we don't reuse talk groups. So I can't go name one 3181 and call it something else. The names are really whatever you want to type into your radio. The talk group is what identifies where your signal's going to go. So worldwide is talk group one. Northeast, 3172. Southern New England, which is very popular around here, is 3109. Uh, Connecticut statewide is 8901. And there's a group that publishes these. They're easy to find. Um, but that's what 
you dial up when you're changing the knob on your radios. Which talk group am I going to? So here's a map of sort of how popular this has gotten. And you'll notice that the pins are different colors. And don't worry about which ones are which for now, other than you can see that we're green in the Northeast. And that is the DMR Mark network. Um, there are different networks out there. So if you look at the sort of purpley, I don't know, whatever that reddish color is over uh, South Carolina. Um, there you go, wine color. That is the NCPRN network. Okay, so they have their own network of repeaters. Um, and then, you look farther west, there's some, some more other different colors with dots, and those are separate networks. So you might say to yourself, well, Michael just keyed up on North America and talked to a guy in Michigan, which could have been on the Illinois network, the Crystal Lake network. How are these networks connected? Well, they're all connected through the internet, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the important thing to note here is that the repeater operator determines which of the network talk groups the repeater will carry for the most part. So if you go to Norwalk, almost all the DMR mark network guys carry worldwide, worldwide English, North America, Northeast. Am I missing any? Southern New England. Well, if you're if you're in this part of the country, yeah, then Southern New England, all right. So because we're carrying worldwide, as long as those guys in purple or whatever other color, if they're carrying worldwide, we magically get connected, even though we're on separate networks. And we'll talk about that, how that's done. So perhaps this will help a little bit to show the difference. So there is, in Connecticut, actually our network now is what called uh, Turbo. Can we rename the network in Connecticut? We have the Aries one? Or? The, no, the other one. The CT Darn. CT Darn. The okay. Sure I thought, oh no, I saw it called TRBO something. Whatever. Um, the map still says turbo, but they, yeah. that's why I use okay. it. Um, so you can see that Worldwide English Talk Group 13 is carried on both the Stanford repeater and the Norwalk repeater. So we could, we could change our radios right now, and I could turn to Norwalk Talk Group 13 and call Mike, who could be on the Stanford repeater Talk Group 13, even though we're on two different networks, because our networks are bridged. Oh, yeah. you, didn't really, you kept talking about one network. Stanford is on the Connecticut area. Right. Network. Connecticut's on, Connecticut has two networks that are covering the state, and Stanford's on the CT Aries network. Norwalk, for example, is on the, the CT Darn network. So, for example, if you want to talk on southern New England, which I don't think is listed there, that's not carried on the CT Aries network. So, think of Cablevision versus Charter. I don't know where you, you guys here probably all have Cablevision, but let's say you live where there's Charter TV or Verizon TV, you're not going to get News 12 because that's a Cablevision property. You're all going to get ABC and ESPN and all the big ones, like worldwide, right? So every network carries the big ones, but yet there are regional differences, and even within regions, there are network differences. So that's something that, and then the last one there, for instance, Bronx has their own network, okay? But they also carry English. So there's a way for everybody to talk together, and then there's a way for everybody to play in their own sandbox as well. So um, there are some standards that people have sort of come up with, although there are some areas of the country that do it upside down. But typically, around here, you'll see the wider area talk groups are on time slot one. Um, the more local group talk groups are on time slot two. And there are also some very local talk groups, like just your repeater, and those are typically on time slot two. Not everybody has those, but we do in this area. So I know I just want to drive around and talk to John. I'm not going to key up on worldwide and light up every single DMR repeater in the world to talk to John, who's next door. We can just go to talk group local and talk among ourselves on our own repeater, just like kind of more like the old analog repeaters. Uh, but you have to know where these are. You have to look them up. TAC 310 I'm not sure they came up with that name, but that's kind of an interesting uh, talk group. What happens there is, let's say, I do want to have a conversation with John, and he's in Florida, right? So the only way I can reach John in Florida, what talk group would I typically use to reach him? North America. North America, right? Because that covers all North America. Northeast wouldn't work. 
Southern New England wouldn't work because he's in Florida. But if we're having a nice long conversation, everybody in North America is listening to it. So if the repeaters have TAC 310, you can key up on that talk group and it just connects those two repeaters for the duration of your QSO, which is kind of cool. That's called a push to talk talk group. It's not always active. You key it up on one repeater, you key it up on the other, all of a sudden you're linked together. Now, if some other guy and some other repeater happens to key up on TAC 310, he'll be listening and chatting with you also, but everybody won't hear it all at once. You won't bring up every repeater either in the region or the country or the world. So it's important to know about that one. However, in my experience so far, these talk groups have not been so excessively busy that anyone would be that upset if you were to carry on a five or ten minute conversation on North America. If someone really wanted to bump in, they, they bump in. Um, not that bad. Um, now the, the thing that sort of drives you a little crazy, and um, let's see if my radio is doing it now. It's probably not because it's too quiet. But there's a little receive light, a little green light on here. I'll just key up the repeater just so you can see it. It's, right? Mm -hmm. You might be sitting here, it's perfectly quiet, but your green light's on. And you're like, what the hell? You know, why am I not hearing anybody? And you get frustrated. It's because there's traffic on another talk group that you're not tuned to. But it's coming out on the same time slot. Is it, is it span time slots? Will it light up green if it's on the other time slot? All right, so if anybody's talking on the frequency, right, your green light will come on. And if you haven't programmed in those talk groups, you'll, you can just keep turning and you won't hear who it is. So that can be a little bit confusing. Um, there's a way to get around that, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. But So that's the whole basics of talk groups and time slots. Here's another picture, again, to emphasize that there are these regional talk groups. So New England's 3172, and then New England, they kind of count New York, no, and Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. No, that's oh, no, I'm sorry, it's Northeast. So that also is confusing, because you'll see any is New England and any is Northeast. So you'll drive yourself nuts with this. So those are some basic groups around the area. So let's look at Norwalk, because that's one of the DMR repeaters close here. A lot of us use it. This is what's carried on Norwalk. I don't know if you can read that from back there, but it's a little tough. Time slot one, which is the first one, two, three, four on there. There's worldwide, worldwide English, North America, and Northeast. That's on time slot one. Remember, we got two time slots, so there could be other conversations on time slot two, and that could be New England wide, or Southern New England, or local, which is, I think, more recently added. So depending on which channel you select on your radio, you could talk on those talk groups if you're within range of the Norwalk repeater. Okay, so that keep that in mind, because I'm going to show you another one. And then there's a question. So here's one in Utah. Looks somewhat similar, right? Time slot one worldwide, time slot one, worldwide English, North America, then on time slot two, they got local, Utah, and mountain. So if we were here in Norwalk, could we call them on talk group 3149, the Utah talk group? Would there be any way to do that from Norwalk? No. Right? Not, not unless for some weird reason that we bridged it. We and, bridged it. Right. So that's the point about there's regional and local things unique to that repeater that aren't worldwide or nationwide. In this case, if we wanted to talk to Someone in Utah, just like my example before, we'd have to find a talk group that's common to both repeaters. So we could do North America. And I could try and find whoever I wanted to talk to, and then we could switch over to that TAC 310 so we weren't bothering anybody. So that's kind of an important concept. Say, well, how come I can't talk to those guys? I can't reach them. It's because your repeater owner either can't carry it or has elected not to carry that uh, talk group. So a little bit of comparison to analog. Um, in analog, and we've all programmed our analog radios, typically each channel is one repeater pair, or it's a simplex channel. That's what goes in the channel on your radio. In DMR, each channel is not only the repeater frequency, it's also the talk group. So if I have to program Norwalk into my radio, it's not one channel, it's six channels if I want all the talk groups. I have to program all six channels. 
and with this software you have to key it all in six times. There's no cut and paste, very limited cut and paste. It's very tedious. No one's written a chirp for these yet to make it easy. Motorola guys, I think, have cut and paste, right? You got some better tools. Uh, get what you pay for. Um, so I find it tedious to program. So that's why you'll hear, um, oh, can I have your code plug? Will you send me the Connecticut code plug? Well, what's this term code plug? But basically, I don't know, I think it dates back to a Motorola term where they actually physically plugged something into the radios years ago. I'm not really sure that had the programming on it. But basically, a code plug is the radio without the hardware. It contains everything the radio is going to do. You flash it into the radio, and that's where all your channels are, all your programming is, all your radio settings is in the code plug, including your ID and your call sign, so that if you take someone else's code plug and load it into your radio, when you key up, you will be them. So you do have to be a little careful to at least change the ID so that when you show up on the repeater, uh, you show up as yourself. It's not the end of the world if you get that wrong, but you don't really want to do that for any length of time. So, so, so yeah. if you're smart, if you're giving somebody code plug, the first thing you do is you Take delete your ID out your radio out ID, you delete out your name. Yeah. Now, I mean, these, these IDs are public. It's all honor system. I could take Mike's ID and stick it in my radio and get on the air and pretend to be him. Yeah, but no, nobody sounds like Mike. That's true. <laughs> or Wayne. <It> never is. <coughs> Wayne. Wayne. Uh, so let's look at the terms. Um, I'm supposing everybody in here is probably at least programmed a radio with a computer, or most of you have, where you've done the load, whether it's Baofeng or ICOM or whoever. So you've got you've you created a file on your computer, and you're using the software, and you say push it to the radio. That's analog. On DMR, it's the same thing, except to call it the code plug. In analog, we have a channel. Your radio might have 50 channels, 100 channels, whatever. DMR, you have a channel. Analog, you might have banks. A lot of our radios have the ability to put channels into banks, so I don't have to look at all my channels at once. I just want to look at Norwalk, Stanford, and wherever I drive every day, and I put that in bank one. My DMR radio, it's called zone my local, or whatever I want to call it. It's a zone. But you must have at least one zone. You don't have to use banks when you have an analog radio, but you do have to have at least one zone, just a group of channels. Everybody knows what PL is? Anybody not know what PL? Right, for bringing up a repeater, that little tone that sends, goes under your signal to tell the repeater that you should uh, key up. Of course, in the commercial world, even though PL came from Motorola originally, that's a trademark name, private line, it's actually continuously tone-coded squelch system is the real name. They changed it and called it color code. So every repeater has a color. Instead of having a PL of 100, it has a color code of 1. Or in your case, in Stanford, and I'm not sure why, yeah. your color code 2. Because there's another repeater on that same frequency pair someplace else. Now, does anybody happen to know, does color code actually equate to a PL tone? Do we know? No? It's all digital. It's all digital. So it's just an embedded. It's not a tone. But it's it, actually. It does okay. the same thing. All right. So that's why they call it a code instead of a tone. Then there's a thing called receive group in DMR, which there is really no analog equivalent to. So let me just hold that thought for a second. You can do scanning on both. Just put, put your radio and scan. And you have a scan list you create to say, these are the channels I want to scan. And then there's something called roaming, um, which is only currently available, I believe, in Motorola. I don't know about the high terrors or the other ones. I'm not sure about that. But with Motorola, you could actually program in the frequencies of every repeater that you travel around through in Connecticut, Massachusetts, whatever. And then you're on the New England talk group. As you're driving, your radio listens for what's the next, the best, strongest repeater, and it just switches you as you drive around. So you stay on your talk group, so you don't miss a beat. You're having a conversation, or even if you're just listening, as you move to areas that have different repeaters that are stronger, it automatically switches. So that's kind of cool if you do a lot of driving. For me, it wasn't a factor for me. I basically stay in this area. I don't, wouldn't do anything for me. But what does work interestingly um, is receive groups. And what that means is if you saw that list of Norwalk talk groups, there's Southern New England and whatever the lists are, if you have your radio tuned to one, you might want to hear if somebody calls you on a different talk group. So you can create this thing called a receive group that lists four or five talk groups. And if anything comes up on any of those talk groups, your radio will unmute and you'll hear it, even though you're tuned to one particular 
channel and talk group. So it's sort of a like scanning, um, but it's not going through channels. It's just listening to all these talk groups. Yes, Sam? Are you allowed to have uh, at least maybe two zones in that uh, receive group list? It's sort of the other way around. Um, the hierarchy is zones, and within zones are channels. Receive groups are actually separate and stand out here. You could attach a receive group to any channel in any zone. So for example, if I have a receive group that monitors um, southern New England and a couple other things, I could attach that to any channel I want. There, it's not, that's not a really good example. Aries is actually a better example. Um, there's this Aries statewide talk group that everybody can reach everybody in the state. There's also local talk groups for each region. So I might leave all the regional talk groups in a receive group just in case somebody keys one up even though I'm usually on statewide, if someone keys up on those regional talk groups, I'll hear it. If there's something going on, I might want to hear it. So it's sort of a different form of scanning. You, sort of, you have to really try it to, to understand it. However, and I'll talk about this later, it is very confusing because your radio goes off and you hear somebody call you. You were sitting there on a particular talk group. You heard your call sign. You went you put your coffee down, came back to your radio, and you keyed up and you're on the wrong talk group because you, your radio is physically set to talk group A. The guy called you on talk group B and you only happen to hear it because you have this receive group. If you don't catch it within five seconds or whatever your radio is set to, you go back to the default talk group your radio is set to. So that can really confuse people. My recommendation, which I'll talk about in a second, is start with the basics. Be very careful these code plugs that are being passed around because they have a lot of advanced features in them they're not so easy to use. So, example of zones. This is my radio, for example, or similar to my radio. I have a zone for Norwalk that has all the channels, the talk groups in Norwalk that I like to listen to. <coughs> Same for Stanford. But why have two zones? So I created a zone called My Favorites, and I put them both in there. So it's like a bank, right? So as I drive around between Norwalk and Stanford, I could just change the knob on the radio and go from you know, Stanford to Norwalk and not have to switch zones and fool around and load a different bank. So you can, you can build these any way you'd like. So here's an example of what it looks like in the programming tool that comes with this radio. So I have Norwalk, and this name, you could put whatever you want in here. There's the only thing that ties this back to the whole system is which talk group is it, and of course they call it a contact name, they don't call it a talk group, and it's a drop down. That ties that talk group to this channel I'm programming. There's my, the stuff we're used to seeing, right? Receive and transmit frequencies. This is like PL, so it's color code one, right? Um, most of this stuff, no one even knows what it is because this is commercial stuff and no one's really using it for anything. Which time slot it's on, okay? So again, you have to know that Southern New England is on time slot two. If you put time slot one in here and you key up, you're getting nothing. So it takes a fair amount of time to program these things. Um, those are the only ones actually required to, to, to key up a channel. Admit criteria color code means if you try and key up while someone else is talking, it'll give you a boop instead of a beep. So it'll block you from stepping on someone. And again, the zones, this is an example of what it actually looks like in the software. I call it my local. And you can see I've got Norwalk and Wilton mixed together so I don't have to switch zones when I'm just driving around where I live. You can see all the channels I've programmed are available but I've only picked a few that I, I actually use. We talked about these repeaters being connected and I'm not going to go too much longer on this because it's, it's very complicated. I don't really understand it but the point is they're connected through something called the C bridge. And this is where each one of these things in here is a repeater. There's a master and a peer. They connect up through a hierarchy uh, where's our master now, um, Mike, for normal? We don't have master, we go straight to the C bridge. So we're straight to a C bridge. So we go right to the, the main routing device. Okay, and then the C bridge is what allows different networks to talk together. I'm going to skip this. But imagine, you know, in your house, you've got a flat network with devices on it. You, maybe someone else has got a network with some devices on it. They can't talk to each other, right, until you add a router, right? and another network. 
So that's basically what the C bridges are doing. They're allowing networks of repeaters to talk between each other. Not for every talk group, but for the ones that have been defined to be shared. DMR Mark is um, probably one of the lead coordinators, right, Mike? They were. I mean, when it started, it was, it was all at Schaumburg. Yeah. But now with the growth, there's Seabridge all over the place. So DMR Mark, the reason it's called Mark, it's the Motorola Amateur Radio Club. So they were the guys who have a lot of this technology commercially. Um, but you could see all these different bridges around. I think initially, weren't we connected to the Illinois Bridge or something? So we were, all of our traffic was going through this magic bridge in Illinois to get onto the big network to talk to all these other networks around the country. Okay, and that's through this thing called a sea bridge, which is made by Raytheon. I think it's very expensive. Uh, Who pays for all of this? The AMSA contributions. So uh, I know there were some guys raising money for um, the stuff we just did on the, the CT DAR network. Yeah, and just like repeaters, you know, clubs pay for it, clubs chip in, people pip chip in, because it does cost some money, especially because all these repeaters are connected to the internet full time. So you got to have internet connectivity. So again, these are the guys who um, sort of originated a lot of the standards and things that go on in the whole DMR world. Just just Google DMR dash mark. You can bring up the repeater list. It's a nice website. You can learn a lot about um, what's going on in the DMR world. Here's um, the way it shows up when I did the screen capture um, of repeaters in. Uh, the New England Turbo Network, which is the name, which now it's CT Darn, whatever, whatever word it is. So you can see there's quite a few in Connecticut. I know that's hard to read. Wallingford, Coventry, Prospect, Bridgeport, Colchester, Killingly, Norwalk, Northford, Ledyard, Vernon. There's got to be more by now since I've... Well, then you get down to my next screen. Um, and then this goes off into, you know, Maine, Massachusetts, so there's a lot, there's a lot going on, and then there's the Aries network. We talked about there are kind of two networks, and if you look at the circles, those are the repeaters up on the Aries network, like yours is. Yes, which is this map was done before Stanford. Yeah, so there's, there's another there. circle right here, and actually there are two more, but I forget where they are. Right, and these are for the most part installed in towers that are part of the Connecticut Telecommunications network, so they're connected through a microwave backbone instead of the internet, so it gives them a little bit more redundancy, I mean, uh, reliability in theory. When, when things collapse, they may stay up longer. But it's, um, it's a nice network. Um, it's totally open to anyone to use. Uh, most of the people tend to hang out on the, um, the CT DARN network, um, but these are, these are wide open. The only time they'd be sort of restricted is if we had a statewide emergency and we were passing emergency traffic. But again, that's what ham radio is all about, right? If there's an emergency and we're using it to pass emergency traffic, that's what we should be doing. So um, most, of the, most of the guys on here are just driving around chatting. Uh, we used it during the snowstorm to pass some traffic back and forth, but it was very minimal. There were only a couple of shelters open, so it really wasn't, wasn't much going on. There's a net every Sunday night, if you guys would like to join in. Um, Aries Net on Connecticut Statewide Talk Group. Um, so I can't cover programming. As Ernie said, we might have a follow-up meeting where people could bring their radios. We could do some programming. But I'll give you some tips. Um, sort of like safe sex. Don't just stick a code plug in your radio that you don't know where it came from. Right? It's just not smart. Um, it, you don't, there, I found errors in every single one I've looked at. Minor. But I found mistakes in every one. But take the time to understand how they'll work and then build your own. I mean, that's what ham radio is all about. Yeah, it's going to take you a couple hours and you're going to make some mistakes, but then you'll really understand what all those settings are. So get one of the big ones, like the one, John's got one that he's tailored a little bit for you guys. Well, it's, it's the, the K1TMM. K1TMM one from, I don't know who K, I don't know him personally. He puts a lot of effort into building these so things are sorted alphabetically and it all kind of makes sense but there's all these special monitoring channels with receive groups and scan lists and unless you know what you're doing and you key up on one of these, you could find yourself really confused and be talking on the wrong talk group. So stay simple for a while, put in just your local repeater, a few talk groups and play with it. Um, 
But again, you're the operator, it's your radio, you're responsible for what comes out of your radio, not the guy who wrote the code plug. Uh, the other thing I find interesting, and I don't know, maybe you guys do this with analog, but I don't, but my, my two meter radio that's in the car, maybe has 10 repeaters programmed into it, right? Norwalk, Stanford, Fairfield, Danbury, New Milford, places I go. I do not have every repeater in Connecticut, or the Bronx, or Manhattan in my radio. I just don't go there. Why would I want to be flipping through all these channels? These code plugs have every repeater known to man in them. There's some fascination with, well, I might miss one. I better have it in my code plug. I recommend you don't do that. Unless you really drive in all these areas all the time, why do you know this stuff in your radio? Um, you might have noticed or heard of, and those of you who have radios have seen it, when someone keys up, their name and call sign shows up on the radio. That's pretty handy, right? Except that the only way it gets in there is if you programmed it in manually, every call sign in Connecticut and name into your software. Now, most people don't do that, so they take the code plug from K1TMM, who does put them all in there. So he keeps up to date with all the hams in Connecticut who are on DMR, and he updates that code plug so that everybody can see the names. I don't use it, because when I'm driving or I'm talking, I'm listening to say NV1P, right? I don't need to go look at my radio and say, so, oh, it was NV1P. You know, I just don't need to do that. So I don't see the fascination with that either. I know I'm being sacrilegious, but it is, it is cool if it's someone you don't know, because you could just look down and say, oh, that's, that's George, you know, I never met him. You could see his name. But it's not required to use the radio is my point. Um, and again, this thing with the receive groups, and I know those of you who haven't played with DMR, I'm sure this is still kind of fuzzy in what a receive group is. Just be careful because your radio's going to unmute. You're going to hear somebody talking, and you're going to say, oh, I want to call him. So you, you key up and call him, but you've waited too long. You're not keying up on what you heard. You're keying up on the talk group your radio's tuned to. So be careful with those receive groups, um, or at least be aware of what they're doing, um, because you will sort of, you'll hear people say, hey, I know you're on the wrong talk group. Yeah, it's not a big deal. It's a hobby. I don't freak out about it, but it's just confusing. Um, if you key back up and he doesn't answer you, it's because you're actually on the wrong talk group. You know, it's kind of funny that for years we had problems with public safety folks who would try to talk back when their radio was scanning. It's one of the reasons why for a lot of our public safety users, we will not let them have scan. Just because of that, that particular problem. And so we haven't been able to avoid it because we're hands and we know what we're programming. Right. And after 20 years of progress, we've gotten to right where we had the public safety tool, exactly where we don't want to be, which is I have no clue what channel I'm on. Yeah. So, so yeah, and any of these don't have the big displays with frequencies and what you're used to. This is what they look like, okay? Um, this is a Motorola radio. These are, you know, I don't know what model this one is, but these are more. It's a 45. 45 okay. One thing you'll notice um, is that the Motorola radios tend to be, you know, a little bit more sturdy, a little bit better features, they sound better, they have better audio. Here's a Hytera, I've not seen one of those in person. And we all have what I like to call the Baofeng of DMR, which is, you'll see they're all right here, right? 195 bucks. Um, it's a good way to get started. Uh, which, do you, which one is that, Michael? Is that the one you have here or is it a different one? No, that's an SL7550. Okay, so roughly 500 bucks and um, more for cables and software, but they do sound better for the most part. Not that these sound bad, but once you hear someone on the Motorola, so you go... And you yeah. mean transmit audio, not receive audio. Yeah, receive transmit audio. Is good on yeah, this. receive audio is yeah, fine, but when, when Michael talks, it's always, he never has that. <coughs> Doesn't sound like that. Sounds like him. Um, the other interesting thing about Motorola, it's not a problem here, we'll help you if you want to buy a Motorola. Motorola is a commercial company. They're still selling software for these radios. This is a commercial product. There's no bootleg copies of Motorola that you're going to find very easily, and you're not, you're not going to want to find one. You have to buy the software. The software is 265 for three years. For three years, and it's not that easy to get. You got to go jump through some hoops to get it. But they've allowed clubs and groups to buy the software and program other people's radios. So there's plenty of guys in the area who have access to the software to program your radio. <coughs> but think about that before you do a Motorola because access to the software, don't just think you're going to download Chirp and program your Motorola. It's not going to happen. It's a very different environment. 
So, you know, my recommendation is if you want to just play with this, start with one of these, and then if you really like it, take the jump up to the, either a mobile rig in the car or, uh, you know, one of the really nice HTs. I mean, they, they are nice pieces of gear. I mean, they're, you know, they're commercial gear. And the repeaters, you know, the boxes that have electronics in them and do something. Um, in, in Connecticut, they're all Motorola's. Actually, almost, I think the majority of the network in DMR world is Motorola. By I think far. Florida's got a high tier network. Yeah. The problem with um, different repeaters is they can't connect together across worldwide, right? But the networking side is proprietary. Yeah. So, you know, I could, you could buy a high tier radio and talk through a Motorola repeater. You, as the end client, can use any DMR radio because that's an international standard. So, no problem with that. If you happen to know somebody who's owns a taxi cab company and they're selling all their DMR radios, fine, that'll work. But um, it's the repeater owners who have to be careful to connect up. That's a business proprietary or manufacturer proprietary uh, system. So only Motorola's will connect to the Motorola network. So that's the overwhelming majority are Motorola's. And you can't really build them yourself. Uh, you have to find a deal somewhere. So here's uh, John added this slide. Um, which I think helps explain a little bit uh, of this whole receive group scanning thing. So let's just take it from the center. I'm on my radio and I've got a channel that's called Stanford Local. So that's the talk group I'm on. If I key up, I'm talking locally just in Stanford. It happens to be in time slot one, the talk group is local, but he's associated a scan list with it and a receive group. Okay, so look over here at the receive group. <coughs> look over here at the scan list. Now again, there's some, well, depending on which group this was, the talk group, there might be a bug here because receive groups can't span time slots. But if he's sitting in his house listening and someone keys up on Northeast or CT TAC 1, he's going to hear it because it's in his receive list. Okay, he's still on the same channel. Meanwhile, he's also scanning these other worldwide, worldwide English, North America. When you push the scan button, it's also scanning and it's listening. So when your radio on mutes and you hear something, you either got to look at it really fast and see what talk group it is because it will light up what it is. Or you're not, you know, you may key up and you're going to key up on local because after the timeout goes, um, you're not keying up on what you were listening to. That's also why it's protocol when you direct your call, you announce what talk group you're on. Very good point. So usually, uh, you know, in the morning you'll hear people get on the repeater and they'll say it's WBT JVB mobile listening. If I do it on DMR, I say WBT JVB mobile listening statewide, listening northeast. That way if someone does have their scan list on and they're away from the radio, they go, oh, that was Paul, he's on northeast, and they can tune to that channel and come back to me the right way. So that is a good a good hint. Always announce your talk group when you first put your call out there. Or you call somebody. Right, so if I call Michael, I'll usually say, you know, I'm on Southern New England, so he knows what to come back to me on. Okay. <coughs> Please tell me that was the last slide. Oh my god. <coughs> so yes, stay <laughs> these radios are strictly digital and not combination digital and analog. No, they will do analog. They will do both? They will do only 440, they're not dual band. So they're just UHF, but they will do analog. And what's the average range with a, with a handheld? It's probably the same as what you're, I'd say it's a little farther than what you're used to with an analog handheld, just because remember that graph of the improved audio for a weaker signal? I mean, I was, I had this in my car, if you're familiar with sort of the Route 7 area. I believe I was testing the Norwalk repeater, it might have been the Wilton one, and I was just running out of range at the Dunkin' Donuts in Richfield on Route 7, just before... Um, that was Norwalk. That was Norwalk, because you were listing that day. And I could never get into that with my analog. And that's with range. the HT, with the, HT. the rubber duct in the car. Then, then I took this off, hooked it up to the magnet on the roof of my Jeep, and I carried it all the way to Danbury. So, as with anything else, antennas make a huge difference. That's just, you know same radio technology we're used to, no difference. Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I was driving uh, north on 95, and I was on the Stanford repeater up past Bridgeport. Full, you know, full, uh, no packet lost that I could detect. 
the other the stations I was talking to were not detecting any packet loss either. Uh, I can't do that with a with a five one analog. Yeah, now I, I was on I was on the external antenna. I wasn't internal, but it was my external quarter wave length antenna um, up through up past Bridgeport. I can't do that with the analog. Any questions? Yes. Will the local repeater route local traffic by itself in the sense that if it's disconnected from the rest of the network, you can still talk to somebody on the local repeater? If, if it drops its network energy? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So in an emergency, the internet goes down, microwave connections go down. It's still standalone. It's still standalone. Uh, there, the slight glitch to that, what it, initially, until we switched this bridging technology, we didn't have a local that worked when the internet was up, so to speak, because it had to be programmed into the bridge to allow a local talk group. But I remember, that I think there was a day, you, me, and Dee were talking, we were all on southern New England, but no one was hearing us because right. the connection had dropped. So we were just merrily talking among ourselves. So it does work. We tested that out the hard way. And we tested it out the hard way for Stanford. <coughs> Ernie. Does each radio have an individual coded ID? No, you put it in. You put it in, yeah. but if somebody knew what your ID was, could they call it up on, on a network and it would find you? No. No. Not like the D-Star call routing thing. Okay. Correct. It does not do that. Any yes. difference in antennas? I mean, it's 440, so I've got a 70 centimeter antenna right now for my analog. Same thing? Yeah, we're in the same frequency ranges, so yeah, no problem at all. Uh, they work great. I was using it on my dual band mag mount and it you know it worked way better than the rubber duck just as you'd expect. It worked fine. Are they mainly on 440? Yes, it's interesting. And uh, with the exception of once you get past Boston. Yeah, mainly in parts of Massachusetts. They're all VHF because of the paved pause radar, the military UHF, something or other, because we're secondary users, there's very little UHF north of Boston. Um, <laughs> We're just yeah, not allowed. Near, near the Cape, right? Yeah. 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 My, well, the interesting thing was uh, my son, who's going to school and working in Boston, um, who got his ticket last year, he doesn't really play on the radio much, but of course I keep giving him radios hoping that he'll talk. So I bought one of these in the VHF version and programmed it in so that he could call, you know, I think we did it once to prove that it worked. Uh, but it was VHF, and I thought that was really weird because everywhere else, I think, Florida, I mean, almost everywhere, everywhere else, else it's UHF. The main reason why it's UHF is because in most areas of the country, there aren't any available repeater pairs in VHF. They may not be very busy, but they're all taken, whereas there were lots of UHF repeater pairs. Yeah, except for in this area, because we're near New York, you know, in busy area, there's no pairs of anything, you know, you really got to scramble to get a coordinated pair. Sam, do you have another question? Yeah. Um is it possible to do simplex with DMR? Yes. They call it top around. There are, the, um, there's two answers to that. One is the Michael's answer, which is talk around, which basically means talking on the output frequency. And you can program a button on this radio. When I push it, I'm in talk around mode, meaning I'm not going through the repeater. And a lot of police and fire do that today with their own radios. They call it talk around because they don't want them learning about channels and simplex and whatever, they just hit a button and they can talk to the guy right next to them. However, there are a couple of nationally recognized simplex frequencies for DMR. I don't... I think DCI has five channels, five frequencies yeah. listed. So, there's no... you know, if you wanted to, to sort of do it right, program those in as simplex, put a color code, I think it's color code one is the standard for simplex. Time slot one. Time slot one, color code one. So, yes, you could all talk to each other on Simplex and it would work fine. I we didn't. should play with that, guys, one of these days. I, I don't think that. it's TDMA, though. Oh, it still is. You talk around it is? Yeah, but you can't run two slots. There, there's no such thing as having four radios and one of you use time slot one, time slot two if you're on the same frequency. There's no because synchronized. Because there's no way to synchronize because you have to have no. one master. Mm -hmm. So, they probably uh, John, do you have it? You should have Simplex on yours or Steve. You know, the question one of the zones. I, and again, you know, when I first went to the first presentation of this, I was like, oh, I don't want this. I don't want one of these. And it was mainly because the presentation was a, a sequence that didn't jive with me. All the data was there, but I just didn't get it. And then, of course, like any ham, I got yeah, the radio yeah. because I had to have one, <laughs> and a couple other guys got them. And I just spent time yeah, 
and looking at the software and understanding zones and channels. Yeah, they're doing simplex. There you go. No repeaters, crystal clear. Notice that, that delay, there's about a three quarters yeah. of a second delay. And it's very, disconcerting. Right. it's very disconcerting if somebody else is listening and you can hear it while you're talking. And you're hearing your voice, but it's you know, three quarters of a second delay to drive you nuts. But they, they, they really sound nice. They're fun to play with. It's not a big ticket to get involved. And we're fortunate that we live in an area. There, you look at other parts of the country. I don't know how many of you guys knew uh, Tony, K1OC from New Canaan. I don't know if you guys knew him. Um, he's in North Carolina. And he, he reads our uh, email reflectors and the websites. And he asked me about what's going on with DMR. And he said, oh, I got to get one. So he got one, and we tried to arrange a schedule. But the repeaters where he is are not as close together and as well done as they are up here. So we really couldn't. We were sort of able to hear each other, but he didn't have the coverage like we have up here. We have repeaters all over the place. That'll teach him to move. Yeah. <laughs> well, he says down there the hand clubs are really active, and they do a lot of stuff. He's very happy down there. Um, but they don't have as much DMR yet. They'll probably get there. Um, but we live in a very very nice area for playing with DMR. You will not be without coverage anywhere from Maine to, I don't know, you know if you're staying on the Main Line corridor. Well, the area's guys are smart. They're, they're approaching clubs like Stanford saying you've got VHF, you've got UHF, you probably don't have a lot of users. Let's say you keep your VHF but convert the UHF to DMR because you can still use local, so it works just like you had before. Yeah. You still got analog on VHF, but now you're part of this big network. So that's a smart way to go, go after the clubs that aren't really getting a lot of use out of both computers. Yep. So I mean that's kind of what we did in Norwalk. We just happened to go on the, the Connecticut the C D Darn network. Uh, and uh, again, don't be freaked out about the programming. It's really bizarre when you first look at it. If there's enough of us around now, I'm more than happy to meet with you and do the programming or even, you know, again, give you the code plug and help you tailor it to what you like to do. Um, that's, that's what's fun about doing this, is helping other people get into it. And when are they going to standardize on one system so that we're all on the same page? I know. I, you know, that doesn't happen. Yeah, it really doesn't happen. It's all part of our business of experimenting. And, you know, I mean, I got into D-Star last year. I bought one. I bought, I bought two. I you know, sold them. Andy talked. He didn't like it. And bought car radio and mobile. And then uh, I just I never used it. I just said, this is silly. I'm going back to my Yezu, and then I bought the Amar. So I don't know. We'll see how long this lasts. I think it's going to have a pretty long, pretty long run. It seems very popular. And uh, the fact that it's cross-manufacturer supported, that it's an, a worldwide standard, I think we'll see some other people making radios. Uh, anybody got any word on? I know there were some rumors. Was it Kenwood? There are some rumors about some other DMR guys Kenwood. entering. Kenwood's close to I think Kenwood makes DMR radios for international, right, or something? Yes. Um, I think they're in it somewhere, but they need to change them to make them suitable for us. Um, I would like to see someone make better software to program them. John and I took a look at the code plug in Hex to try and see if we could figure out maybe there's some way we could, you know, I don't have the time to write the program to do that, but it's a really bizarre looking format. And I think I realized why there's spaces between everything, because it's Chinese, it's double byte character set. That's why. Oh. That's why everything <laughs> had you one of two we, bytes. One of the things you know? we saw, like if you had a name, you know, like my call sign would be W space B space two space R space Y space V space. That that's mean, why. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's Chinese. No, it doesn't. But it, it just mean it uses double word for. Sorry. Yeah, but why? Why would you? Why do would that you take the space? Unless you need. Well, have you didn't tell how it was defined in the software. How how the character. Yeah, it's just, it's just weird when you look at it, and you know, so what I did is had an empty code plug, and they're all the exact same number of bytes. If you look in your file, they're all, not 256K, or 257. They're all an exact size, because they're just taking that hunk of data, when you load it in the program, it's just sticking it in the memory that's in there. There's no magic to it. It's not like it's doing any kind of back and forth. It's just take this and dump it there. So they're all the same size, whether you have one channel programmed or a thousand. They're all 256 or 257. Yeah. There, is, 257. there is a communication protocol between the PC and the unit yeah. that tells it here comes a block. Sure. It's dead long and Absolutely, but I'm saying this, it's not like it's replacing these five channels or if your code plug's bigger, it takes up more space in the file. 
So that's why there's a limit of X number of channels or X number of talk groups because the file can only be that size. You'd have to really work at it to fill that up. Someone had decoded it because there's that, that software that you can export uh, from the from this Connect system yeah. stuff. And then you can put it into a spreadsheet, reorganize it, and yeah. then dump it back into an external program. So that kind of yeah, thing. and now it's using screen scrape, what's called screen scraping yeah, technology. It's, it's acting as if it's keying the stuff in. It's yeah, it has. They may have decoded it, but he hasn't been able to encode it. I yeah. don't know. So, I mean, I, but I've that's coming. I guarantee you, if someone gets their mind to it, I mean, it's just bits and bytes. You just got to know what's the, you know, what are the end markers, what ends a zone, what starts a zone, and someone will figure it out. Because but it needs to be chirpable, that's all I can say. Because there's a lot this more is weirdness. impossible. There's a lot more weirdness to it. For example, the frequency, 445.700, is, is in the file as 007544. Um, there's the, they, a lot of the stuff that he did as a um, um, real number. You know, real floating point, floating point number, which doesn't make any sense at all. So, I don't, I don't know what I don't know what they were thinking. So the uh, you think that's that's a number you saw in the file. Yeah. So yeah. just not to get sidetracked, just before I can stop talking, Connect Systems is the brand name that we're, we're a lot of us are using to get started. So you can Google them. They have a very rudimentary website. If you want to order one, you actually have to pick up the phone and call hey, Jerry. Them. And talk to Jerry, right? There's none of this, uh, you know. Or fill it in, click caution, one, PayPal. Don't go, no, don't go to some of these sites. That they don't go to sell. eBay. There's they charge you more. Yeah, a lot more. You go right to Connect Systems. They tell you, call us, and we'll get you one. It's a very low, low budget operation. They're putting their money into the radios. Uh, or not? Yeah. Well, hopefully, yeah. Uh, it's supposed to be coming out with some uh, mobile and an HT that'll also do DSTAR at the same time. I have my doubts, but it'll be interesting to see. Uh, and then, though, if you got a connection with Motorola or you really want to buy a Motorola, those are out there. Those you get, or most people are getting them on eBay, I think. It's one good source if you know what the, you're the looking first, for. This, the 6550 and the 4550, yeah. yeah. There aren't really any of these new views for it out yet. Yeah. So, um, but you know, if you're interested in that, talk to one of the guys who has the Motorola's. I know Michael does. I think Charles has Motorola's. Steve, Steve has more Motorola's. He knows what to do with. Yeah. So, that's it. Any other questions? Yeah, but I still have this entry.